So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm, I'm John Lund, so I uh, run our developer network um, around the world. So you've noticed I've got a, a non-American accent. That's because I live in England. Um, so PayPal is a, a big American company, but we have a policy of uh, finding people that we like and letting them live where they want to live, which is slightly different from some other companies that you hear about today. Um, I've, before I came to PayPal, I had three start startups which I sold. Um, um, after my last startup, I was kind of bored trying to work out what to do. Um, PayPal called me and said, would you like to join? I'm like, nah, big American company, I don't do that. I'm a startup guy. And they said, you'll be the fourth guy in England, or in Europe and uh, you can pay your mortgage. I'm like, excellent, that's good news. I'll make a change. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the future of shopping, um, and I'm going to need this. So I'll take you on a journey, and I'll take you on a journey of where shopping's going, and there's a number of different things. Firstly, there's the, the future of shopping on the web. There's the future of shopping on mobile, the future on, of shopping in retail, so shops, and then the future of shopping on wearables, which is the cool new thing everybody's talking about. So I'll talk you through some pretty futuristic stuff, but, um, and some of this will be wrong, but that's the problem with trying to predict the future. Um, you can't really do it that well, but I'll try my best. So let's talk about the web first. And interesting enough, the web, everybody's a bit bored of the web now. You know, We've had it for a few years. Um, we do new funky stuff, but actually web shopping is completely changing at the moment. And it's changing for a very, very strange reason. Um, this is a very, very bad website. Um, this is a very bad website because just look at the pure amount of information on this website. This is like websites used to be six years ago. Um, if your website looks like this, please change it. But really, this, this has a fundamental problem with this, and the problem is people. And people are changing. Psychology of people are, is changing hugely. This is something called the magpie effect. What has happened is our attention spans over the last, since the internet has basically come out and become popular, has changed. Our attention span has got much, much lower. People don't go anywhere as deep into anything at all in life as they used to. And we used to think it was just young people. We thought it was the net, net internet generation was actually, you know, very low attention span. You know, all they did is play Xbox, blah, blah, blah. But actually, they've just done a survey of over 60s. And an over 60-year-old now, in, in five, six, seven years ago, used to go into two or three pieces of data and go very, very deep. So they used to go to the library, get a magazine, and read a huge amount of information. Now, on average, they're doing six pieces of data, and they're only going as third to deep on each as they used to. So everybody is scanning stuff now. They're scanning stuff very, very fast. And this manifests itself in 16 to 18-year-olds now who spend, on average, 16 seconds on a website. That's the average time they spend on one side. So if you think about your website, if it looked like the previous slide that we had up there, you're not going to sell anything. Because if a teenager is going to come to your website and spend 16 seconds on that, how the hell are they going to get any information about what they should be buying and where? And what this means is the new websites, the ones that are doing well at the world, actually tell you what you want to look at before you even get there. So they are actually profiling you. And you know, Michael's been talking about data. It's all to do with data. They're profiling what you want and what you like before you even get there because they know they've only got you for 16, 20, maybe 30 seconds. And if they can provide that information you're looking for exactly now, you're more likely to buy and, and trade on that website. And that's what we've done with uh, the e new eBay. So eBay looks very different than it used to. If you haven't been there recently, go back and have a look. This is the new eBay. Now, this is a bit weird, so I share that my eBay account with my girlfriend. I'm not into hats, OK? Just, just <laughs> you can tell that's my stuff at the bottom is the geek toys. But what this basically does is it looks at things that I've bought and spent time on on eBay. And the next time I go there, this is my home page. So I go back to eBay every day to see geek toys. I actually collect guitars, but my girlfriend's been doing more shopping than me. So normally it would show a new, for example, I like Gibson guitars. So I would go back to eBay every day just to see if there's a bargain or a Gibson guitar that I'm looking for or want on eBay. So basically what happens is you change the shopping site that you only go to when you want something to a shopping site that you go to every day in case you want something. And that's how shopping's changing. It's actually becoming part of your day activity. You come in the morning, you might check Fab, you might check eBay, you might check other, you know, social networks, etc. but you actually are expecting to be fed content directly to you from shopping. And that's changed, that's very changed. So if you're building any kind of e-commerce site, you really need to start looking at providing the information and actually the 
article that that person might want to buy straight up on the home page, not the article you want to sell. This is, of course, all around data. <laughs> We've just talked about data and be talking around this. And data is about shopping is very, very interesting data. We, so eBay is a company. We have the most commercial shopping data of any company in the world. We own 30 or 40 different companies. We own pretty much every classified site in Europe, plus eBay, StubHub, um, Gumtree, a variety of other companies. So we have a huge amount of data on what people are buying and where. And as of someone who's creating a website and a shop, you actually need access to data, to your own data. So constantly grabbing, grabbing that data and giving what we call in-context experiences based on that data is really, really important. So have a look at your data, and we, we talked about earlier, and look at how your data might allow you to predict what people are trying to do on your site, and actually use that data to design your website to meet your customers' needs. And that's really, really different from the old way. The old way was find out where you're going to make the most profit and put that on the home page. That's not going to work anymore. <coughs> of course, having data on individuals requires you to need to know who they are. So there's lots of different things out there, and I, I could do a whole talk on the different types of identity out there. But let me be very clear. There are three different types of identity. There's perceived identity, so what you believe you are. Now, all of us, we can be honest, all of us have our internet identity and our real identity, and they're not always the same. Um, actually, in most cases, they're not the same. So in many cases, you think you're a lion, but you're actually a pussycat. And generally on the internet, you're always pretending to be a lion. So um, that's really important. There's other, so, so for me, that makes you know, logging into systems or that log in with on a number of different things actually kind of pointless because you're logging in with, for example, your social identity, whatever social network you use. And that social identity is based on the belief that you're a lion, not the truth that you're a pussycat. So if you're actually trying to find out is someone really who they say they are and start to predict their behavior based on the data you have on them, you actually need a genuine or a, a, a controlled identity. You need an identity that can be you know, authenticated. And if you think about it, where is the one place in the world you make sure your details and your identity is 100% up to date? Any guesses? There's a clue on the thing behind me. It's your bank. You always make sure your details are right in your bank because that's where you keep your money and you like your money, you care about your money and you get paid into your bank and you pay your bills from your bank. So you always make sure your address is up to date in your bank, your phone number is up to date in your bank. So if you can leverage a bank as actually your identity provider, then you have a very strong identity product. And that's what we try and do with our product, which is login with PayPal. So login with PayPal uses your financial details to actually verify that you are who you say you are. Now, you can't be a dog with a bank account, is what I used to say. I've just discovered in the last three weeks that in Minnesota, in America, a dog can have a bank account. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> the other thing that's changing very much in shopping is people's patience. As I said, our patience with everything has reduced really, really low. And that's even got to the level where our, our patience has got so low that we're not prepared to wait for something to be delivered to our house. So this is actually changing a variety of things. And this is an experiment that we're running in the US called eBay Now. So with eBay Now, I can go on and I can order something on eBay and I can have it delivered to me within one hour wherever I am in, in the seven cities we're doing this experiment. It's not where I ordered from or my address, it's where I am now. So if I order the item, I turn on the eBay Now app and I go to the coffee shop, um, they know I'm in the coffee shop because they can track my GPS. So they actually deliver to where I am at this minute in time. And this is actually changing, again, it's that attention span. It's changing how shopping works because people not only Used to be you went online if you had a bit of time and you could get it delivered tomorrow. Now actually you can get deli stuff delivered quicker than if you went down the shop. And that's really changing shopping completely. Um, at this experiment, we just bought a company in London called Shuttle um, so that we can do the same thing in Europe. And we're constantly expanding this so we can do basically one hour delivers, deliveries of anything you want anywhere you are. Now the other thing that's happening is if there's something you want you can't get now, you can actually go and get someone to make it for you. So the whole, whole crowdfunding is really, you know, it's going wild everywhere. And, you know, using Indiegogo, Kickstarter, I'm completely addicted to this site. I buy every piece of crappy gadget I need. They never get delivered. Um, <laughs> but I have literally everything. Um, but it's literally a case in the old days, to go and build a product was incredibly hard. You would have to go to your bank. You would have to get a loan. You would then have to go and find a, a factory. You would have to go and find a company who was prepared to invest in your patents and your beliefs. 
Now you can literally come up with a good idea, go onto a crowdfunding site, post that idea and see who wants your product. And that's kind of been shown, that's not only been done by small companies, it's been done by um, big companies. So Ubuntu, the, the, my, um, the Linux Ubuntu, actually used crowdfunding to see if they should bother building a phone. It was the biggest ever crowdfunded campaign. They went on, went on and they did the advert for a Linux-based new mobile operating system um, built into a piece of hardware. And they, I think they wanted $30,000 I think they got to like fifteen or seventeen thousand um, dollars, which proved that people liked the idea, but they didn't want to spend money on it, and that was great because it saved them actually going the whole way down a route building a product that failed to sell in the shop. They knew early that they shouldn't bother building this product, um, and they used crowd crowdfunding to do that. So this changed the way you get products, and whether products exist or not is now so much easier to get something that you want or have someone make it for you, which takes us on to the next thing. Everybody knows what this is. 3D printer. Okay, we're now going to run a quiz. What's this? Anyone? Any guesses? Noodles. Noodles. 3D printed spaghetti. So um, there's a company in Italy called Berea who make pasta. Do you know Berea Pasta? Berea Pasta uh, created a 3D printing spaghetti machine. Um, this is going to be installed in restaurants throughout Europe. Um, and you are able to go on, so it's Valentine's Day, you really want to impress your girlfriend. You can go online, you can 3D design your own pasta shapes. You then send that to the restaurant, and when your girlfriend gets her dinner, it's your design pasta. Is that romantic? Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea how it tastes. <laughs> but this is interesting. I mean, 3D printing has been able to print in a variety of different, different methods before. It's always kind of, whenever you see them, it's plastic. That has completely changed now. Um, last week, I read an article, they managed to 3D print with carbon fiber, which is incredible. Um, you can 3D print with metal now. They're printing with gold and silver, um, and they're printing food. So let's try the new, next one. What do you think this is? 3D printed chocolate. So even freaky, if you really want to freak your girlfriend out, what you can do is you can take a photo of her, three different photos, send it to these guys, and they will 3D print her face in chocolate. <laughs> How romantic is that? <laughs> So you can print in chocolate. Um, you could, moving on, do you think this is? Cakes, 3D printed cakes. So the first time a company actually has made a machine for printing in sugar and cakes. So you can actually print cakes now. Um, so you know, just looking at food, the things that you're able to print. Now, interesting enough, NASA claims it's created 3D printed pizza, but I don't believe them. Um, but they reckon they can print the ingredients um, to make a pizza in space. Um, I haven't seen it. I don't quite believe them, but we're getting close. Um, you're able to print a variety of different substances. Now, if you take that and you combine, this is a piece of research that's going on in the University of Singapore. And what they've actually created is a, a, a device that clips to your tongue um, and stimulates say, taste, different tastes. And what they're able to do is uh, get you to taste sweet, sour, all the different tastes, which is interesting enough. What's more interesting for me is they've actually created a markup language called Taste XML. And Taste XML actually allows you to mark up taste. So if you think you can mark up taste, you can then mark up the taste of food. And when you start thinking about what that means when you combine it with maybe a 3D printer, is you're starting to get recipes for printing things. Who watches Star Trek? This is Star Trek Replicator, if you haven't seen it. This uh, Jean-Luc Picard will walk up this and go, old gray hot, normally. And he has his tea 3D printed for him, um, or created for him. Actually, this is probably where the world's coming. I have a 3D printer, but I'm a geek. Um, I reckon pretty much every household will have a 3D printer in their house in three years' time. And I think what you will start buying and selling online will actually be recipes for things. So you'll buy the, the, the recipe to make food, the recipe to make the products that you want for your house. I think this is very good for the environment because it means we'll have less ships crossing the sea full of products that people want. It'll actually be ships crossing the sea with filament to make the products that you want when you make them. I don't think this world is that far off when it comes to the future of shopping. You will sit in front of whatever device it is, whether it's a computer or a replicator, and actually order a recipe for something that you want now. Um, and you know, it's pretty futuristic, but I don't think it's that far off. So let's talk a little bit about the future of mobile. So my mobile is my second brain. 
however romantic I think I am with my 3D printed chocolate and pasta, I never remember my uh, girlfriend's birthday or anniversary every year. Um, my phone does, it's great. So my phone remembers things better than I do. My phone actually knows where I'm supposed to be. My phone actually knows where I am. I, I ran out of batteries in Dublin the other day and realized without Google Maps, I have no idea how to do anything anymore, which is kind of sad. Um, but it, we're in state now where your phone is sitting and is controlling almost everything around your life. So let's try another quiz. Do you know what this is? It's not, actually. It's the lock on my door. Um, this is a, a replacement for your standard lock and key that you have on your, on your door. My keys are on my cell phone. If, for example, a plumber is coming to my house, I can email him my keys. He receives my, key, his, my keys on his phone and he can open my door. So this is basically completely connected to my mobile. My, my door system is now running off my mobile phone. I don't need to carry keys. You can do the same thing with your car. So this is the Viper system for cars. You're able to install this in your car and start your car with your mobile phone. You can sit indoors, so it's Norway, it's very cold. You can sit indoors and turn your car on to warm it up before you go and sit in your car. You can open the boot, you can do all that kind of stuff. But again, if I want my girlfriend to drive my car, I can send her my keys digitally. So that's happening that way. This is a, a smart sensor. This is actually device um, sticks onto a variety of different things and allows me to find my phone, well not my phone because I need my phone to find it, allows me to find anything around the house based on these smart stickers. So again, it's allowing me to find things. My phone is the central hub. Everybody knows what this is. This is a jawbone, you've got the Fitbit, the Nike fuel band. These constant, I mean, the amount of people wearing these now and it's monitoring, uh, monitoring everything they do all day, how many steps they take, their sleep patterns, how many kilometers, calories, etc., that they're going through. We're carrying this, these all depend on your phone. This is a new device, anyone seen this? This is a blood pressure monitor um, that fits in your pocket and connects to your cell phone. Really, really useful. A lot of people have very high blood pressure and um, carrying those great big things that you strap onto your arm is not easy. This literally can slide in your pocket, connect to your phone and check your blood pressure. Again, requires your phone as the hub. All of these devices around you, the world we're moving to is where your mobile phone essentially becomes your second brain, stays in your pocket and connects to everything that you have. Now, if you think about it, what is the, you think about the, what you carry around every day and think about what's in your wallet. So this is a strange internet phenomenon. People go online, take everything out of their wallet or their handbag, take a photo of it. And there's an entire website where you can go and see what's in people's bags and their wallets. Anyway, I don't know why, but what this actually shows is how much stuff you carry in your wallet. And you think about it, how much of that stuff could we make digital? And how much do you actually need the contents of that wallet? So the most, most of us and, uh, will find that the majority of your wallet is actually full of loyalty cards, which is crazy. So you'll find you have your airline loyalty card, your shop loyalty card, all the rest of it. That's just a number. It has no need to carry a card, and there's some apps to replace that. You've got things like coupons, vouchers, and, and we'll look at some of these. So loyalty, for example, all of those loyalty cards, you can go and download an app like Card Mobility. You can scan all your cards and keep them in app. You don't need a wallet anymore. Um, Coupons, everybody, I mean, there's a small number of the population who really, 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 really love coupons. Um, but it's a small quantity of the population. And uh, they, you see a lot of startups who go into the couponing industry and they, they think have huge, huge growth to start with. And what happens is they grow, 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 then they go flat and then they never go any higher. Because really there's only a small amount of people who use coupons and they use them a lot. Um, and they're not mainly used by the population. But you put them in a cell phone, you put them in a mobile wallet, for example, then they suddenly become more useful because they're handy, you have them around, and in some cases they will influence what you do. And then it comes to payments. So that's the other thing, that's what your wallet was for first, all right? You can put your pictures in Instagram, you can put your loyalty cards in card mobility, um, you can put your coupons in a variety of different apps out there. But then you come to payment, and you want the payment on the mobile phone and the way that you pay to be really, really simple. So you want it to be invisible. That's the ideal way to make a payment on a mobile phone. Because you only have two hands. And when you're trying to make a payment on the mobile phone with a card, you have a problem. You have a mobile phone, you have a card. You only have two hands. You're like, how am I going to type this now? So actually what you need to do is completely lose the whole payment flow that is completely seamless. So I'll just show you a couple of technologies that, that we, we've got out there. The first one is Card.io, which is one of our technologies. It allows you to pay for payment with a credit card and all you do is hold your phone over your credit card, and what it actually does is it records a movie of your credit card, not a picture, um, 
encrypts it, scans it, and then that's it, you've paid. So all you need to do to make a payment, card up, scan, off you go. Um, we've got technologies like Venmo Touch. We bought Braintree back in November. Um, Venmo Touch allows you to basically go to one website like TaskRabbit, um, enter your card details once, and then any time you go to any other website, you never need to type your card details again. So literally, you go into TaskRabbit, and then next day you go into YPlan for the first time, you no need to type your card details. So it's removed everything, including the PayPal login, right? So you know, traditionally with PayPal, you have to log in with username and password. With Venmo Touch, you don't. You just have to have used a website that has used it in the past. And then, of course, you can, um, you can always send money with the traditional PayPal just from your email. But what we've announced this week, and I, I just got back from Barcelona, is the new Samsung Galaxy S5 phone, um, which is going to be launched in April. Actually, you can pay with PayPal with your fingerprint. So if you want to make a payment on any website, you just go to the website, click on the PayPal button, put your fingerprint on the reader, and you've paid. And so it's really, we're, we're trying to move to a world where the payment becomes so invisible you don't have to think about it. And to do that, you really need to know who the person is on that phone. And the nice thing about mobile phones is, is one mobile phone per person. For a computer, you often share a computer with many people. With a mobile phone, it's yours. We know who it belongs to, we know where you are. So you can actually use the mobile phone as the authentication. And when it comes to shopping on a mobile phone, what you really, really need to do, and we talked about the web in the 16 seconds, is serve people what they want immediately on the mobile phone. Don't, don't give them any browsing time. They hate browsing on phones. And if you're going to make a mobile phone the way that you pay your friends, either through you know, the PayPal app or any other app, what you need to do is actually make another way and allow you to accept money from third parties. So you can actually accept money. I could ask Michael to give me some money now, and he could give me his credit card. He wouldn't, but give me his credit card, and then I could use this device here. So this is a PayPal here chip and pin device that we developed two years ago. This allows me, with my mobile phone, to take a credit card payment with chip and fin, pin for a very low cost. I can keep this in my pocket. I can use this once a year. Um, or if I've got a market stand, or you know, I'm a plumber, or anything like this, this is just a Bluetooth device that sits in my pocket. So we've suddenly made it possible for everyone to take credit card payments, not just people who have bank accounts. And what we're really trying to do is exactly what we did online, which was um, make payments democrat democratize. So don't only allow people with bank accounts, merchant accounts, and businesses to um, take payments. Allow everyone to take a payment from each other. And that's the only way we're going to kill cash. And I really, really, really want to kill cash. So let's talk about the future of retail. And I, I really like this, uh, this slide, because that's the future of retail. That shopping cart is enjoying its retirement on a beach somewhere. And we really need to get rid of these things. So who here has seen Minority Report? Do you remember this scene when Minority, he, he run, he's running away, he runs into the shop and all the holograms display saying, welcome back, Mr. whatever his name is. Um, welcome back, you got, uh, this is the cardigan you bought last time. You've got the, the same cardigan, a different color, and he's like freaking out because he doesn't want anyone to know he's there. Well, this world is here now, and I'll talk you through where we are with this. So think about shopping. What's the worst thing about shopping? Anyone know? Well, that's partly it. Actually, the worst thing is paying. And the even stupider thing about it is they make you queue up to pay. How broken is that? So if you think about how, what, what we're trying to do and how we're trying to change shopping is we're trying to solve problems and make your life better. So the first thing about shopping is let's stop people queuing to do the worst thing. Let's remove the queue. Let's stop people actually having to go somewhere to pay. Let's let them pay wherever they want in the shop whenever they want. The other bad thing about shopping is going to a shop and finding that they don't have the thing that you wanted. Um, that's a real waste of time. And if you, you're built like me, then most clothes shops don't have the things you want. So uh, let's get rid of that as well. What we're trying to do at PayPal is we're trying to take the data that we talked about before plus your identity, combine them, and then make a seamless shopping experience. So the idea here is, say, for example, if you go on a website, that website knows who you are, they know where you live, they know what articles you've looked at, and they know where you go afterwards. If you walk into a shop five days in a row, they still don't know anything about you by the last day. So how do you take that data that you've got online, or the data you have about an individual, and bring it into a shop, and then make the whole shopping experience a much better experience? So for example, a really good experience would be, I'm shopping online, I look at a pair of jeans, 
I spend five minutes looking at them, but I don't buy them. The next day I go into the shop that owns that website. As I walk in the door, they say, hey, hello, John. You looked at these jeans last night. Here they are in your size. Would you like to try them on? Now, that's a nice shopping experience. That might make me go back into a shop, because the only reason you really walk into a physical shop is to see a human being. And I get really, really annoyed when that human being knows less about the product I want than me, and I don't go there. So actually, what you start to give the human beings in the shop the data that will allow them to serve me better, I might start going back into the shop. So with check-in, this is uh, the PayPal product check-in. It's very similar to something like a Foursquare or Facebook check-in. I can check into that store before I go there. And when I arrive in the store, what happens is my face appears on their till. So they can see I'm in their store. My face is up there. The first thing that means if I want to pay, all I need to do is say, I want to pay, wave, and uh, I've paid. So they look at me. That looks like me. My, shop, my phone is in the store, and I've paid. So I don't need to go up to a counter. I don't need to queue. Actually, the, the shop assistants in the stores that we're using in the UK walk around with tablets. And they're able to come up to you, help you. You pay it with a tablet. You don't need to go and queue and do anything like that. What it also allows is that shop to get that date, good data about me. But even more, um, project, for example, we're running with Jamba Juice in the US, is you can go into the app, check into your local Jamba Juice when you're sitting in your bed at home, pick your juice when you want it, press go, walk to the shop, it's waiting for you on the counter, you pick it up, you walk out. You don't have to talk to anyone. And if you're like me in the morning, that's a really good thing for everyone. Um, and this is where we're going with this. So we're basically taking the data about you, giving it to the merchant early so they can give you a good customer experience, and then removing the queue. And that's what we've done with check-in. But that was too hard, because you have to take your phone out of your pocket and check in. And so what we've actually done is released at, at early end of last year something called the PayPal Beacon. And a PayPal Beacon is a low energy Bluetooth beacon. You're able to actually plug into a USB port in a store or an electricity socket. When I walk into the store for the first time, it wakes my phone up. My mobile phone wakes up and says, welcome to this store, John. Would you like to check in and pay with PayPal? Next time I go to that store, I don't have to take my phone out of my pocket. I can just walk straight in, and it instantly checks me into that store and knows that I've come into the shop. Nice thing about Beacon is it doesn't require the user to have any internet connection on their phone. So it basically uses the Beacon as a Wi-Fi hub. So it means it will actually work in most stores. A lot of people who are rolling out Beacons at the moment, they require the cell phone to have internet. About 60% of UK stores, for example, you're not going to get 3G, 3G reception or any reception at all indoors. And this actually solves that problem. So Beacon, we're rolling out as quickly as we possibly can. And what we did differently is we gave the first 100 to developers. We said, developers, tell us what you would do with Beacon. What will you build? And the ones with the best ideas we gave the Beacons to. We didn't give them to our big, powerful partners. We actually gave them to developers. So I'm really excited to see what's going to happen here. For example, I've already seen a company build these into taxis. And you're able to uh, just pay with a taxi by sitting in it. You don't even have to get a phone, book it through anything. You literally walk in the taxi, sit down, get out the taxi, and you've paid. Um, again, making life a little easier. The other thing that annoys me a huge amount about shopping is this. And what, what's wrong with this picture? Apart from they're too rich. <laughs> it's all these bags. People carrying bags around. So whenever you go shopping in retail shop, you end up loaded down with bags. That's really stupid. You go into a wine shop, you order six bottles of wine, and they make you carry this like, huge thing back to your car. So why can't you walk into a store and say, I want that product at my house at 5.30 this evening? Thank you. Walk out. That's actually what it should be. And when you look at eBay now and Shuttle and the other things you're doing, that's what we're trying to look at now, whereas you can actually essentially have the items delivered to your house straight away, immediately, whenever you want them, rather than walking around with uh, shopping bags everywhere you go. And that will solve a lot of problems that we have with cities, like congestion, parking, all that kind of stuff. If you don't need to carry anything, then you don't need your car. Um, so it's actually, I think it's good for the human beings and the planet. But secondly, I hate carrying shopping bags. So the store of the future, and a lot of people talk about showcasing. I actually think the store of the future is a combination between a showcase and a warehouse. So the store of the future, you will walk into. They won't have every size of the shirt you want, but they'll, and they'll have basically one size of the shirt, an XL of the shirt, and they'll have one color of every shirt. So they'll have very little stock. What you can see is, what does the shirt fit me, and does the color look good, and then it's delivered to my house. Or you order online, you walk in the store, it's waiting for you in the store. They're actually going to turn to a stage where you can use the human beings in the store 
to influence what people go and buy, rather than have a great big pile of stuff that you have to sift through to find what you might buy. And I think the stores of the future will look a lot more like the Apple store and a lot less like a supermarket. And that means we don't need shopping trolleys so they can go and retire. Finally, wearable technology. So the exciting stuff. Um, this is completely going to change everything. I think that having sensors and all the rest on your body and around you, um, we're all going to be carrying them. I've already, I walk around my Pebble watch. Um, I have sensors in a variety of different, I actually have five smart watch, watches, but I'm a geek. Um, but it's going to really change pretty much how you interact with the world. So firstly, you know, here's the Pebble smartwatch. The Pebble smartwatch um, was one of the first smartwatches out there. Um, but it's clipped to my wrist all the time. It's constantly telling me what I, what, I, what I need to do, where I need to be, who's calling me, all this kind of stuff. Um, but you can take that a bit further. You can actually start to use the smartwatch to do things like check-in. So again, last, last Sunday at Mobile Congress, we released with Samsung the Galaxy Gear 2 watch that's just um, is coming out now. And that has PayPal built into it. So if I want to check into a store, I actually just go like that on my watch and I can check into the store. So, and, that, and the same thing also connects to Beacon. So if I'm going to a store that takes the Beacon, it connects through my watch. So now the watch is becoming useful, and you think a lot of people are trying to say NFC, NFC, NFC. I hate NFC. I think it's useless. It doesn't solve any problems. Why is it so much easier to take your phone out of your pocket? Is it to take your wallet out of your pocket? <laughs> it doesn't, speeds up your life by about five seconds, and people don't really care. However, being able to walk in, do that to pay, or do that to check in, is actually a much more natural human thing to do. So you'll see a lot more uses of smartwatches when it actually comes to payment apps and functionality. Of course, the famous Google Glass. Um, I don't actually see people walking around with these very much, and we all laugh at them and call them glass holes. But um, the, the truth is, I see it's actually the shop assistants wearing things like Google Glass. They actually put people standing in the store. So as you walk in, it's feeding you data about who this shopper is, what they're doing, what they want. Um, and I see these actually coming pretty soon. Um, so that you get in and you'll actually get a good customer experience because data is being fed to the shop assistant, not the individual. Does anyone know what this is? This is the Sony Smart Wig. <laughs> I have no idea. This is actually from their patent application. This is a, a, a wig that is going to connect to your smartphone and give you feedback by vibrating on different parts of your head. <laughs> I have no idea what they're going to do with them, and I have too much hair anyway, so I'm not going to buy one. But anyway. It's interesting. Anyone know what this is? This is a Google contact lens. How scary is that? All you people who are worried about Google. Actually, it's not as sinister as it sounds. The Google contact lens is designed for diabetic people. And what it actually does is, is measure the liquids in your eye. And um, when you're starting to get low blood sugars, it actually alerts your phone and tells you to take your insulin. So um, you're starting to put things in your eyes. It's another piece of smart sense you'll be carrying around. Does anyone know what this is? This is the hug jacket. So this jacket um, allows you to buy one for yourself and your girlfriend, back to the romance. And I can give myself a hug any in the anywhere in the world, and she gets a hug too. I don't know. <laughs> Smart clothing is coming. Smart clothing is coming much quicker, quicker than you think. I actually ordered this week a, 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 a sports shirt um, that has sensors throughout the whole thing. It can measure your breathing rate, your heartbeat. Um, it can measure a whole variety, like how warm you're getting, and actually tell you when you're going to have a heart attack when you're running, or etc. But um, smart clothing is coming really, really fast. Uh, one I did see, which is kind of weird the other day, is one that tells you when you need to wash it. Probably for developers like me. But, um, <laughs> but there's a whole load of smart, smart technologies actually starting to be built into clothes, into jackets, into, into different parts. And again, it's got, you know, these smart sensors are going absolutely everywhere. I mean, this, this is a, a, another Kickstarter project. This smart sensor can detect all kinds of stuff. I think um, it can detect voltage, capacity, it can um, detect nitrogen, different gases in the environment. Uh, it's, it's $60, this thing. It's uh, incredibly cheap, Bluetooth to your phone. But it's able to detect a whole variety of di different things. There's people making plant pots that actually connect you, tell you on Twitter when you need to water your plants, um, and tell you what nutrients you need to put in your soil. These smart sensors are going everywhere in your life. Um, and we've been talking, that's the, that's the nest, by the way. We've been talking about you know, the smart fridge for a long, long time now, the internet fridge, the fridge that will order for you. And you know, it's here, actually, already. And the, the way you can tell this, and it sounds really strange, is 17% of the world's spam is actually coming from smart devices. 
So uh, some, there are lots of these devices out there with very, very bad vulnerabilities in them. Um, but it's good to know that actually they're out there. The smart fridge exists today, You're the fridge that can order your milk for you. And I would argue these wearable technologies, including the phone, along with smart data, will actually start to order things for you in your life. So you think about it, the really boring things like ordering the milk, ordering the bread, the things that use up a lot of your life would be so much better if the machines did that for you. And that then gives you more time to do the stuff you really want to do. The only challenge for everyone is make sure that extra free time you get because your devices are shopping for you, you don't spend working, all right? That's just have to promise. Because <laughs> that's what's happening at the moment. But if your devices shop for you, devices do your shopping for you, you have more free time and you have a better life quality of life. And I strongly believe that's the future of shopping. Now, just to give it the PayPal spin, PayPal has always had the philosophy that a wallet should not sit in the phone or a wallet should not sit in your computer, or a wallet should sit in the cloud. And the reason for that is you have many devices. So you have a, a smartphone, you have a laptop, you might have a fridge, you have a, a vest, 3D printer, etc. All those things will need to make payments at some stage, which means if you put your wallet in your phone, you would have to use your phone for all those things, which makes no sense. What you do is you put your wallet in the cloud with very good APIs, and then you let each of those devices connect up to your cloud wallet to make payments. And that's exactly how we've designed PayPal and what we're doing with PayPal, and why we think we're actually in the prime position to be the main way that people are going to pay in the future. So that's it. Thank you. It's amazing. Uh, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience, but first I have one. <laughs> Um, you are a part of a large corporation, you touched upon it earlier in, in your uh, presentation. Uh, how is such a big company able to generate so much innovation? How do you do it? So the, f the first thing, um, one of the reasons I live in England is I didn't want to live in headquarters because um, I get away with a lot of shit because no one knows I'm there. Um, <laughs> so that's part of it. But uh, to be honest, um, we didn't always. We actually, uh, our previous regime, we had a banker running the company um, and he hired lots of bankers and our innovation stopped. Um, our new CEO that, uh, that came in a couple of years ago, David, um, before he took over PayPal, he ran a company with 50 people, a startup. And we bought his company, and a year later he was running a company of 15,000 people. And he's literally come with the attitude, we need to be back to our startup roots. So he's brought in a whole new board and a whole new um, exec team that are all startup and entrepreneurs. And he's split us into small user groups, so we, we use Agile. Um, all our products are built on Agile. We have small, small groups that work independently of the core. Um, and we've kind of accelerated our innovation hugely by essentially saying, look, let's do lots of experiments. And until we fire the cannon. And basically, once those experiments have had a bit of success, then we fire the cannon, rather than just fire the cannon. And that's meant that, you know, we, last year we released, I think, 14 products, which is more than we've released in four years. And it's literally just a very big change in culture and the kind of people that we're hiring. And, you know, we, we're, we're now becoming a sexy place to work, whereas I'd say four years ago, no one would have wanted to work for us. So that's your banker. Second question, just to follow up that, is how, how do you... Um engaged the community outside the company how, how do you uh, get the talents how do you get in contact with the right guys that you would like to develop the products for you the first thing is we built a platform that we just do payments right that's all we do so we built a platform that allows people to innovate on top of us and we've always said all along you guys go and build your businesses and just let us deal with the payment bit and not, to do that we've created very very good APIs that allow people to connect to us um, and then my team goes out to the communities we spend you know 95% of our time in incubators in, um, in hack spaces we run hackathons um, uh, you know we run competitions we go out meet people we speak at conferences and my team will find them pretty much everywhere in the world all the time talking to people and uh, finding out what they're doing and we try and help them we have a blueprint program where um, if, if you're part of one of the blueprint incubators then we'll actually help you with all parts of your business as well as give you free payment processing to get you up and running interesting so any questions from the audience there's one Uh, I'm, st I'm strugg struggling to understand the concept of, of the 3D printer. Um, how, do, how does it work, really? Um, 
uh, do you want need uh, more, more than one printer to uh, to make different pro products? So um, imagine you have a bicycle, and imagine you break uh, a part of your bicycle. Right, you have a choice today. Right, you need that part of your bicycle. You can either go to a store and hope they have it in stock. You can go online. You can buy that article online and wait for it to be delivered. In the future, you'll be able to go to the website of the bicycle manufacturer, click on the item, download the recipe, and print it on your machine. Does that make sense? Uh, I, don't know, <laughs> I, don't, I still don't understand how it's possible. Yes, it's definitely possible. And it's already starting to happen. You, you Literally, a recipe of items it's just, it's just a bunch of data so whether it's using taste xml or something else um you can you can download images you can download products already for like the makey makey community they have a huge directory of products you can download and print them at home so it's definitely possible thank you hello my name is herman um on my banking, I see PayPal as something that could substitute my credit card, but I would never use them when buying a used car or when the transaction is more than equal equivalent of two thousand pounds or more. Is that part of your strategy, or is PayPal looking to for other markets than those you have today? So at the moment, we restrict it to low to lower values. Say two thousand is quite high. Um, we deliberately did that. Um, for a number of reasons, the main reason being risk and fraud. Um, however, you would see um, in the US, for example, and the UK, we're now offering credit. So we're actually able to lend you money to buy things, and we're doing credit in a very different way. Unlike uh, most credit companies that wait for you to fail and then hit you, we actually don't want you to fail. So we constantly make, you know, the idea is we will get you that money so that you can pay for things, but we're not going to penalize you if you're late payment, paying means all that. And we kind of made the pledge that we will never charge a late payment fee. Um, and we really, because we want to do that so that the whole of the commerce infrastructure is moving better and smoother. And I think, you know, we are starting to look at cars. We're starting to look at high value items. And I think now that we're a bit more mature, I mean, we're only 12 years old as a company, right? Um, now we're getting a bit more mature. We're, 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 I think we're pretty close to doing high value items. We moved, we paid someone $100,000 the other day. For winning our hackathon. <laughs> okay. Back. Yes. Thanks for a great presentation. Just had uh, two two reflections. One uh, one being this personal uh, personalized shopping experience and and the, the sites knowing you before you go there. Uh, can you comment to the sort of the paradox of being too customized or too personalized? So you you only look at history. And, and uh, you, you could put people in small circles, in a sense, instead of having them explore new, new products. And, 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 and they can become very stigmatized, in a sense. So, so yeah, I mean, you're completely right. If all you looked is one set of data. Um, but there's really interesting, and probably Mike, Michael can talk more around this stuff. But actually, um, there's, there's, first, you know, there's different indexes. And one of the indexes to look at is what we would call the trust index, or the trust graph. And if you think there's people that you know that you might trust to give you advice on what clothes to wear, but you wouldn't trust them to tell you what restaurant to go to. And what you're able to do is actually take those different levels of trust and actually start to give recommendations to people based on who they trust and why they trust them. And if you look at just simply at eBay and the way that eBay is doing recommendations, that's based on this sort of trust combined with social. And I think you're right. If all we looked at one set of data, it would be incredibly boring and everybody would buy the same thing. However, if you can actually get a lot of that data around, as I said, we have more commercial data than anyone else in the world, we're able to look at what think people like you usually buy, and then you can get different layers of abstraction away from that. Um, so actually, with data, you're able to suggest things to me that I might be interested in before I've even thought about them. Great. Thanks. Take two more questions. Hi, um, I noticed that a lot of your examples were um, of products were actually crowdfunded products, including the Pebble watch you're wearing, and uh, we're a crowdfunding platform uh, which just launched. And I just wanted to find out what PayPal's plans were uh, in terms of crowdfunding, because we applied for the, for example, the um, PayPal uh, Adaptive System yeah. API, and there was so many, there are so many limitations. Um, so it's it feels a bit. Um, counter um, 
a bit counter what you were saying about really loving the model and actually what is actually in being implemented in behind the sure. scenes. So I think, um, I mean, two things. One, well, main thing about crowdfunding is you're funding a dream, right? Um, and, you know, you're, it's only a matter of time before someone puts something on crowdfunding of high value that doesn't exist and does a runner. And I think it's, it's very, very high risk for a payment company to do crowdfunding at all. And you'll see that actually amongst our competitors, there's only us and Amazon are the only two companies that support crowdfunding. And the, re the reason for that is there's a huge amount of loss in it. Um, and so we're, we, are, we are very supportive of crowdfunding. We've actually put a brand new model in to support crowdfunding. Um, and we, you know, I think it's a case of talking to the right people. So please come and talk to me afterwards. We, we, we can work with you on the right model. I think it's just a case of balancing the risk. And what we've done with crowdfunding now is instead of guaranteeing as a user you will get your product, which we do with every other PayPal transaction, we let you know right at the beginning, okay, this is a crowdfunded transaction. We're not going to guarantee you get your product. Are you okay with that? If so, continue. Okay, we have two more questions. There's one behind you there. Uh, I'm just uh, wondering what's your take on Bitcoins? Um, you get that question everywhere. Where's that? Of course. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I've got a Bitcoin miner in my loft. I'm a geek. I like the, I li I like the maths. I like everything about Bitcoin, um, but it's not ready for business. And the reason for that is it fluctuates too much. So say, for example, you want to sell, I don't know, a bottle of Coke on your website. What are you going to charge in Bitcoins? Because today, now it might be five euros. In 10 minutes, it might be 500 euros. It's just too hard to do business based on Bitcoin until it stabilizes. So we've, we've said you know, PayPal is willing to look at Bitcoin as soon as it gets stabilized. The problem is, in, in my head, uh, sadly, I don't think Bitcoin will ever stabilize until it gets regulated, which kind of defeats the point. Um, so love it, but it's not a currency. OK, last question. Yeah, you were talking about that personal uh, shopping experience that when, when you enter the store, you get data on you. Um, but you have two or several different purchase behaviors. If you're buying for yourself or for others, your family, your friends, uh, uh, significant dates or other. Do you have any ways of refining that data to make it make sense? So we take you through a variety of different ways. We put you in a browse mode to start with. So you can actually put yourself in a mode to say, I'm just browsing, which means don't come over and hassle me. Um, and then, then you can put yourself in ready to buy mode and other things like that. And what we're looking at is how we can actually match the data about you and the people you know together. So for example, um, how can I get the data about my girlfriend linked to my profile? And we're doing a whole load of experiments around that. But if I can go into a shop, um, again, for Valentine's Day and I want to buy my girlfriend a dress, I should be able to say, what size is she? Because I'll get that wrong. Uh, and it will, it will tell me in, in, in my profile, I can say, OK, this item is for my girlfriend to the shop assistant. And they can say, OK, your girlfriend is so-and-so. I know what size she is, and I can give you the item. I think that actually gets very, very useful. But privacy, it's got, you've got to work out how to do this in a, in a private and non-spooky way. Thank you. Um, since this is an entrepreneurial day, I have a question. If I was uh, an, uh, running a startup and I had, or uh, I was an engineer in a company, I had a good idea, how should I approach you? How would that be? Well, firstly, send me an email. I answer every e email I'm sent. Um, so, um, or contact me on Twitter. I'll give. It, I'll put on my details later. Um, my team uh, is, looks after startups. The first thing, go and have a look at the, the Startup Blueprint website and have a look if there's an incubator on there that works with us. Try and get the incubator and you get a whole variety of benefits. Um, watch the news next week. I can't tell you what about, but watch the news next week. Um, that will help you as well. Um, but really, yeah, just get in touch with us, developer at paypal.com. My team will get back to you. Happy to talk to you about your business model and how to help you. Um, you know. All of us have come from startups. PayPal used to be a startup. We get it. We really, really understand it. Um, and we really want to make you guys successful. Thank you. Please give a big hand to John Lee.